Good evening. It's good to see you here. Let's go ahead, Sam, grab our hymnal, turn to page number 49. Blessed be the name, page number 49. <laughs> On the first, all praise to him who reigns above in majesty supreme, who gave his son for man to die that he might man redeem. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. On the second, his name above all names shall stand, exalted more and more. At God the Father's own right hand, where angel hosts adore. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. On the third, Redeemer, Savior, friend of man, once ruined by the fall, thou hast devised salvation's plan, for thou hast died for all. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. On the last, his name shall be the Counselor, the mighty Prince of Peace. Of all earth's kingdoms conquerors, whose reign shall never cease. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name of the Lord. Well, what a great song. Amen. You notice the words, you know, all praise to him who reigns above and talk about his majesty and him ruling and reigning. His name above all names shall stand, exalted more and more. We sing that, man. I think it's a great song. Look up underneath the title. It gives the reference of where that came from. Job 121. Let me read the whole verse for you. Hello. Now, this is after Job had lost all of his children, all of his his donkeys were gone. His barns were blown down. He said, it says in verse 20, the verse 4, And Job arose, rent his mantle, and shaved his head, and fell down up upon the ground. This is after they were told about all of his, everybody was killed. He fell down on the ground and worshipped. And said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb. Naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away Blessed be the name of the Lord. The next verse says, In all this, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. Man, that's convicting. Yeah. Worst day of his life, and what's he doing? He's falling on his face, worshiping and blessing the name of the Lord. That's why God said there's none like him in all the earth. That's why God bragged on him. Amen. Man, what a great song. That's Dr. Joe Boyd's favorite song. And uh, he's in the presence of the Lord, blessing his name now. Amen. Amen. Aren't you glad you came to church tonight? Yeah. It's great to be in church. I'll tell you what, I've been looking forward to being here with you all tonight. Let's pray and ask God to help us. Father, we want to thank you for how good you are to us. May we have the attitude that Job had that we would bless your holy name. No matter what circumstance we're facing, may we just realize how wonderful of a God you are and that everything that happens to us in our life, it's, our life's better than we deserve. Because we don't deserve anything but hell forever. But because of your mercy and your love, we're here tonight. I pray you'll bless us as we study the scriptures together, as we spend some time in, in uh, looking over the, the prayer list and praying together. Let's pray you use the, the service tonight to help us. 
and uh, help us as we pray for others in our service and others in our church that are hurting physically and we just ask your hand be upon it, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. you. may be seated. Ushers are down with our guest registration packets and also our prayer bulletins. Anybody need a prayer bulletin, hold up your hand. I don't see any first-timers. And uh, Brother Hunley, what do you think we ought to do with the setting on there? I'm not, I couldn't figure out where to set the, the therm thermostat tonight. To me, it seems warm and stuffy. Let's kick it over the other way, Brother Hunley, when you get back there, if you would. I was going to do that, but I thought I'd wait. So it's one of the time of years you never know, you know. I went out, I mean, this afternoon was gorgeous. What a beautiful day. I scraped frost off my window this morning. <laughs> It'll probably have two inches of snow tomorrow. And Alan will come clean all that off my car. Because he loves snow. I do love snow. Ah, sick man, sick man. But anyway, you hear this in time? Yeah. What are you going to do? Good help's hard to find. All right. Uh, we're going to skip that next announcement since we'll take care of that. Um, car building activity on Saturday. All right. That'll, uh, that'll start at, what's up? We got that at noon, right? We get that at noon. And so be here for that. Uh, if you're going to help, uh, if you're planning on building a car for the, the uh, um, Grand Prix that's coming up, we'll have uh, opportunity for you to come together. And, and uh, Brother Hunley's been working on getting some tools ready for us. Cutting power tools, power Man. tools, hallelujah. We'll have all kinds of cool stuff here, and I know that uh, Brother Calcaterra is bringing some things over, and uh, we'll start at noon, we'll, we'll go throughout the afternoon, and just come when you can. If you can't be here right at noon, that's all right, just come in the letter. Uh, the doors will be open, we'll just come, we'll be open the fellowship hall, working on stuff, and uh, be a good time to get together and uh, just enjoy fellowship, help your boys build a car, help your girls build a car. Amen? And it's going to be a good time. I'm looking forward to the race in a couple weeks. And Alan's going to come tell you about that right now. All right, Grand Prix is coming up on Saturday, uh, April the 15th, just a few weeks away. Uh, we're going to have a good time. Uh, it is going to start at noon, 12 p.m., and go to 3 o'clock. And it is open to all ages, so little kids, big kids, and everywhere in between. Um, Show up for that. Uh, get your kits from Brother Chuck. He does have both the wedges as well as the blocks available for you to pick up. And there will be concessions available to purchase on that day. So just come. Uh, have a good time. Even if you're not going to participate in racing, just come. Just have a good time with the family. Amen. So that again is Saturday, April the 15th at 12 p.m. And then on April the 8th, the teens are going to be going down to... Uh, Hope Baptist Church in Toledo, Ohio. Uh, we're going to be leaving here about 7.45, 8 o'clock-ish in the morning and be back about 6. Uh, the youth rally is, though, from 9.30 to 4, so that's why we want to leave as early as we can so that we can avoid traffic. It's a Saturday, but you never know, and hopefully there's no snow. Prayerfully, there's no snow. As much as I like it, I don't want snow on that day. Um, our special speaker, um, that they're having that day is Pastor Jeremy Coburnett. Um, I heard he's a good preacher. I've never heard him personally, um, so I'm looking forward to hearing a, a, another preacher. Um, the cost is $10 per person. Um, one thing that my wife brought up to me, and I don't know the answer to this, are we stopping anywhere on the way home? Absolutely. All right, so they need extra. Right <laughs> so they're going to need extra money for food for on the way home. <laughs> so it's $10 for the youth rally plus extra money for uh, for supper after. The, the activity. So again, that's April the 8th. We'll meet here at 745 so we can get on the road as soon as possible. All right, let's go ahead and stand once again. Turn to page number 51. Blessed Assurance. We'll sing the verse first and then shake hands with one another. Page number 51. <clears throat> On the first blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste 
of glory divine, heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Go ahead and shake hands with one another. Sunday night, but we switched it because Bernie wasn't here this past Sunday. So we're going to switch back to the one that we haven't done on the Sunday morning yet. No, that's the men's group. That's the men's group. Oh, yeah, we'll practice that on Sunday. Okay. After choir. I'm confused. That's all right. Just show up. We'll point you in the right direction. Anyway, but I bought this, instead of doing it all by hand, I bought this software where I can just take all my files. So in this particular pro or project, I took all 52 files that I had between two cameras on my audio, dumped in this program, told it to sync, and it linked everything up together, put it all in the right spot, and then swapped out the audio, the onboard audio with the high-res audio I recorded. Cool. It saves me hours. All right, as we make our way back to our seats, we'll continue singing on verse number two of page 51, Blessed Assurance. Perfect submission, perfect delight, visions of rapture now burst on my sight. Angels descending bring from above echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long on the last. 
perfect submission, all is at rest. I in my Savior am happy and blessed, watching and waiting, looking above. Filled with his goodness, lost in his love. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. Good singing. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity to come to church on a Wednesday. Thank you that we live in a country that allows us to meet publicly and openly to uh, learn your book and worship your name. I pray you'll be with us tonight as we take up the offering, bless the gifts and the giver, and be with Pastor as he preaches in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. Well, it's good to see all of you tonight and looking forward to our study. And uh, let's take our Bibles and uh, have them handy. You're going to use them a lot tonight. We're going to be all over the place. Uh, you know how I, I mark my verses? I have little tabs that I put here. I ran out of tabs this way and started putting some across the top, if that tells you anything. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah, we're going to do a Bible study tonight. Amen. And uh, I told y'all on Sunday, we're looking at the thought of when did Jesus die? When did Jesus die? And uh, what day of the week? We're going to find out. Uh, we're going to find out what, pretty close to what time. Pretty, pretty much. And uh, we'll be looking at it because the Bible has those answers. Aren't you glad you don't have to doubt about this kind of stuff? That, that God just tells us. And uh, so we're going to look at it. We're going to look at a couple of verses. You're going to wonder at first, why are we reading these? But you'll find out by the time we get to the end. So Colossians chapter number 2, verse number 4. And this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. For though I be absent in the flesh, yet am I with you in the spirit, joying and beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. Rooted and built up in him, established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding therewith, I'm sorry, therein with thanksgiving. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality. And power, Man, there's some great truths in those verses right there. And uh, we're going to talk tonight about, uh, about tradition and, uh, and just being established in the faith. I believe we ought to know what we believe and why we believe it. Yes. Amen. And uh, then let's go to the book of 1 Peter, if you would. 1 Peter chapter number 1. And we'll look at verse number 18. We'll start reading. We'll read verses 18. And, uh, oh, let's see, how far will we go? We will read, uh, we'll read down through, uh, just for tonight, through verse number 19, for sake of time. We have a lot of other verses we'll look at. 1 Peter 1, 18, For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish, and without spot. We're, we're, we're redeemed, uh, not by religion, not by any offering that you bring, not by getting in a, in a baptistry, or as Caleb calls it, a tub. 
What did God say? He said, can I get in the tub now? Well, if you mean the one at home, yes. No, that one. <laughs> and that won't save you. Amen. Dr. Boyd used to tell us about that. He said, you go in there, you can go in a, a, a dry center, come up a wet center. Yeah. Amen. It's not going to do anything for you. No, it's with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Uh, you're there in 1 Peter. Go to 2 Peter chapter 2, or chapter 1, excuse me. 2 Peter chapter 1. And we'll look at verse number 15 and following. Moreover, I will endeavor that ye may be able after my decease to have these things always in remembrance. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of His majesty. And we'll continue reading for the context. For He received... From God the Father, honor and glory, when there came such a voice to Him from the excellent glory, that is, uh, that this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with Him in the Holy Mount. What an amazing statement He just makes right there. He said, when we come to you and we're preaching, we're not following some fable, something somebody put together, some story, some fake religion that somebody crafted to fool people. He said, no, we were eyewitnesses of His majesty. Think about who's writing this. Of course, we understand the Holy Spirit is instructing Peter what to write. But Peter had spent three and a half years with Jesus in the flesh. Amen. He was there. And he's talking here in verse 17 and 18 about that day they were up on top of the Mount of Transfiguration. He said, and we heard the voice of the Father saying, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. He said, we heard that. But look at verse 19. We have also a more sure word of prophecy. Rent till you do well that you take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star rise in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. What he's saying here is we have something better than the experience I had on a mountain with Jesus. Can you imagine being on the mountain with Jesus and, and of course, James was there and, and John was there and, and the voice of the Father speaking and, and, and you, you were there, you saw all that. And Peter says, there's something better than that. That's your Bible. A more sure word of prophecy. See, a voice isn't as good as a verse. The devil's the master at making up voices. Amen. Now, he was there when the Father spoke. They knew it was him. But there have been a lot of people, well, you know, this happened to me. No, what does the book say? We've got to base what we believe, not on what somebody told us they experienced. It's going to be based on the Word of God. These are great verses. And so uh, tonight we're going to look at this thought of when did Jesus die. We're going to look at a few things. And uh, so give me your Bibles handy. Let's pray. And ask the Lord to help us. Father, as we look at this study, I pray you'd help us as we examine the Scriptures and kind of go through your book tonight and just see what you say about this matter of when did Jesus die. Help us understand how important it is and how much of our, of our faith, what we believe, hinges upon what we believe about this matter. So I pray you'd help us tonight as we study. Make it easy to teach. Make it easy to, to understand. And Father, I pray you would strengthen us in our faith in, the, in your dear Son, and how He took our place on the cross for our sins, but He rose again victorious, showing that one day we too will rise. And so, Father, I pray You'd help us as we study. In Jesus' name, amen. Some people say it's not important on what day Jesus was crucified. But the very fact that you say you believe in salvation by grace says that it is important what day it was that on which Jesus was crucified. Everything we believe, as I said a moment ago, must come from the Bible, not what some guy told us. I, I so thank God for my pastor back home when he would, he would not allow us to say, well, I believe this, and then just not give him Scripture. He made us show us, show us Bible. Uh, you see, tradition, and, and, and when I say tradition, let me just kind of back up when I'm going to use that term a lot. Uh, I, I'm talking about Catholicism mm -hmm. and Protestantism after that. Yeah. And we're going to see in a minute, we're not Protestants because Baptists were never part of the Catholic Church and we were never part of the Protestants. 
both of those groups persecuted Baptists. So just, just so you know, I mean, people like, uh, you know, like Wesley and, 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 and Martin Luther, they didn't like Baptists. We talk about, you know, famous Methodist circuit riding preacher Peter Cartwright. In his biography, his favorite sport was to chase a Baptist preacher out of town. So, you know, why, why I, I, I'm glad that those men, I believe they were saved. I'm glad that they, they, they tried to do something for God. But I'm also glad I had some people in my history taught me the Bible. Amen. And, uh, and so just lay the, some of those things down. Uh, tradition says that Jesus died on a Friday, hence Good Friday. Uh, some, they say he died sometime between 3 and, and 6 p.m. And that he was put, on, uh, put in the grave at that point, And that he arose from the grave sometime early on Sunday morning. And I am amazed how many people accept that without even thinking about it. There's a couple of songs that I've heard even independent Baptist college groups sing that are beautiful songs, Brother Rich. But they're not Bible. <laughs> they got Jesus being crucified on Friday. And uh, if you have a Bible that has the harmony of the Gospels that compares all, uh, sp specifically the first three, the, and, then, and then, you know, of course, John, and, and almost, in fact, I've never seen a harmony of the Gospels that didn't have Jesus being crucified on Friday. And, uh, and let me just say this, I, I, I use a reference Bible, but the only thing inspired in this book are the verses. None of the footnotes. None of the cross-references. Every reference Bible I've ever picked up, I have found mistakes in them. Uh, I'm probably the only person you're, you've ever met that has studied through every footnote in the old Schofield Bible. I spent two years going through every footnote and checking every cross-reference. And I have a copy of a Schofield where I've marked out, this is not right, and here's why. And a bunch of them. Uh, John O'Reilly's uh, his, uh, his, uh, um, reference Bible. There are a lot of things in there that just don't match up with Scripture. I'm talking about footnotes. And so we've got to be careful what we believe comes from the Bible. And... Uh, and so uh, we're going to look and see what the Bible says about that. And, and the first thing that we're, that we're going to talk about, of course, is uh, uh, just the, the matter of three days and three nights. Uh, and, 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 of course, uh, I'll give you a little, little thought on that. And um, uh, let's see. I don't, I don't want to get into that yet. They say he died on, on Wednesday about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, was placed in the grave before 6, and that he was in the grave um, you know, on, um, I'm, I'm sorry, they say that he, he died on Friday and that happened. But, but let me just, I'll tell you the time frame and then we'll get to go through the scriptures and show it and uh, give you some cross references for that. And I think it'll be a help to you. Um, I'll go ahead and say this now, then we'll get into the scriptures. Jesus died at three o'clock on Wednesday afternoon. By the way, it was as dark as midnight when that happened. He was placed in the grave before 6 o'clock that evening, uh, or before sundown, or before sunset. He was in the grave Wednesday evening and Thursday. Thursday evening and Friday. Friday evening and Saturday. And he rose from the dead sometime between sundown on what we would call Saturday night and sun up on Sunday morning. Because when Mary came to the grave, he wasn't there. <laughs> Amen. They didn't roll away the stone to let him out. He was already gone. Amen. And, uh, and so we're going to look at that, but we're going to look at the importance of why three days and three nights. Not parts of three days and three nights. And we'll look at that very carefully. So to, to begin, let's go all the way back to the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 1. And so we'll start there. There's only 1,189 chapters in the Bible. We'll look at most of them. No, I'm kidding. But we do have to start at the beginning. Amen? Genesis 1. Of course, we, you know, we could all quote the first verse, in the beginning God. And by the way, I like the way God starts that. He didn't give any explanation of himself. In the beginning God. Yep, in the beginning he was already here. Amen? In the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. 
And God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. Read the last part with me. And the evening and the morning were the first day. Now, every one of the days of creation ends that same way. The evening and the morning were the second day and the third day. Um, in, the, in the Jewish way of looking at things, they counted their day from evening to morning. Why? Because it was dark first. Then God brought the light. So anytime that they talk about evening and morning, they're acknowledging the fact there is a creator who created everything. It wasn't an explosion of a star that caused all this. It wasn't a big bang. It was God speaking. Amen. Amen. And, and so we need to, and that's why David said, evening and morning and at noon will I pray and cry aloud and he will hear my voice. Why? Because he's talking about all day. Because that's how a Jewish person would talk about their day. And so evening and morning were the first day. Um, in almost every place in your Bible, almost every place, when the word day is used, it means a 24-hour period of time. Now, there are a few exceptions, and God tells you what they are. He'll talk about the day of the Lord. He's talking about a period of time, how He's dealing with man. Uh, the day of His calamity, and things like that. But in, through creation, it's the evening and the morning. The light part, He called? What do He call it? And the dark part, He called? night. And so the Bible says Jesus was to be in the grave for three days and three nights. You say, uh, well, where does it say that? Well, I'm glad you asked. Go to the book of Matthew and keep a place here in the Old Testament. We'll get him right back to, to Exodus in a moment. Book of Matthew, chapter number 12. Matthew 12. Look at verse number 39. I'm sorry, 38, we'll start there. Then certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see a sign from thee. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. Talk about Jonah. For as Jonas was, read it with me, three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be, read it with me, Three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So one of two things is, is true. Either Jesus was in the grave for three days and three nights, or he's the biggest liar of history. That's why this is important. Because this is what Jesus said. He said, just like Jonah, not parts of three days. And we'll get to a moment how they count it. Um, let's see here. Let's, uh, let's look at some, uh, you're there in John, go to uh, New Testament, go to the book of John, John chapter 11. And we'll look at a, uh, a statement Jesus made. John 11, in verse number 9. Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours in the day? If any man walk in the day, he stumbleth not because he seeth the light of this world. But if a man walk in the night, he stumbleth, because there is no light in him. So Jesus very clearly says here, how many hours are in a day? Twelve. Twelve. So he's again talking about the difference between the light part of a 24-hour period of time and the, the dark part, night and day. The night being the dark part, the light part being uh, the, the day. And so he's talking about 12 hours in a day. Now let's go back to the book of Exodus, chapter number 13. Exodus chapter 13. And we'll see this continues through the scriptures. You know, God is a God of patterns. You see Him do things over and over again, and you recognize that it's Him because He's done it the same way over and over again. Look at uh, Exodus chapter 13 and verse number 21. Exodus 13, verse 21. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them, in the, uh, by the, uh, lead them the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to lead them by light to go by, read it with me, day and night. And so we see here, even when he led the children of Israel with a pillar, a pillar of fire by night, a pillar of cloud by day. So we see God is working with this pattern. Jesus said that he was going to be in the grave three days and three nights, just like Jonah was in the whale's bedding. So think about this, if you want to do your math. 
How many hours are in a day? Jesus said 12. All right. So if he's going to be in the grave three days, how many hours of daylight is he going to be in the grave? 36. 12 times 3, 36. You didn't know you were going to have a math quiz tonight, did you? It's not going to get much harder than that because I'll get confused. And I have notes. If there's 12 hours in a day, there's 24 hours in, 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 a, in what we call a day, a 24-hour period, it leaves how many, days, how many hours for night? 12. So if he's in the grave three days, that's how many hours total? If he's in the grave three nights, how many hours is that? Okay, so 72 hours at least. Jesus has to be in the grave 72 hours. Is that not what he said? All right. Now, let's look at what tradition says. Tradition says Jesus was crucified on Friday. And we're going to look at why they say that in a minute. And then we'll show you what the Bible really says. But they say he, had to be in, he, was, he was crucified on Friday. He died about 3 o'clock. And that from Friday, from 3 p.m. to midnight, that's nine hours. And then he was in the grave all of, from midnight Friday to midnight Saturday. That's 24 hours. And that from midnight, about 6 a.m. on Sunday... That's six hours. You add that up, they got 39 hours that supposedly Jesus was in the grave. You know what the problem with that is? You're missing 33 hours. And Jesus said three days and three nights. Now, let's, uh, let's go to the book of Matthew, chapter number 28. And we'll start with what we know already. All right, Matthew 28. And we'll look at verse number 1. Matthew 28, I know it's in here somewhere, there it is, Matthew 28. Of course, Matthew 27 is when Jesus was crucified. We see him buried in verse number 30, uh, 57 and following. Verse 62 of chapter 27, the, 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 the grave is sealed. Chapter 28, verse 1, in the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week. Now, what day of the week, what day is that? What day is it? Sunday. Sunday. So we know that now we're talking about Sunday morning. At the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. Behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning, and his raiment was white as snow. For fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. And the angel answered and said unto the woman, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. Oh, I love verse 6. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come see the place where the Lord lay. Can you imagine being those two ladies in the garden right then? Now here it is. It's sun up on Sunday morning. That's why churches have sunrise services. I remember when I was uh, with Gary Lovins as his assistant, uh, he decided one Easter to do a sunrise service. And he preached the sunrise service. I mean, it was six o'clock in the morning. We're having church. That's hard enough right there. And then we had breakfast. I mean, after we had the service, we had this big spread. Then we had the morning service. He said, Brother Doug, why don't you preach Sunday morning? Yeah, right. You had them here at 6 o'clock in the morning. Then you fed them, and you want me to keep them awake. Thank you very little. Amen. <laughs> We're not doing a sunrise service. And if we do, Brother Allen's preaching the morning service after the breakfast. <laughs> uh, now, we know then that Jesus had to have been raised from the dead before sunup on Sunday morning. So we got to work backwards from there. Amen? So when he came, he was already, when they came, he was already gone. And so we're going to look at, at it, it had to be three days and three nights. Now let's take your Bibles and go to the book of, of Luke, chapter number 23, and we'll see why tradition, meaning Catholics and Protestants, and unfortunately a lot of Baptists because they've listened to too many Protestants and Catholics, why they say, well, he had to be crucified on Friday. Let's look at Luke 23. Did I give you the chapter? Luke 23. And we'll begin at verse number 52. Um, of course, in, uh, actually, we'll back up to verse 50. 
Now behold, there was a man named Joseph, a counselor, and he was a good man and a just. The same was not consenting to the counsel and deed of them. He was of Arimathea, of the, uh, the, a city of the Jews, who also himself waited for the kingdom of God. So this is Joseph of Arimathea. Of, of Arimathea. He, he was a believer. Uh, he, was, he wasn't part of those that wanted to crucify Jesus. It says in verse 52, this man went unto Pilate and begged the body of Jesus. And he took it down and wrapped it in linen and laid it in the sepulcher that was hewn in stone, wherein never man before was laid. Now, of course, we know this was his own tomb. He owned it. He was a rich man. And uh, so he, (coughs) along with Nicodemus, we know from the other scriptures, he goes to Pilate and said, can I have the body of Jesus? I want to bury it. And so they take the body down. He he prepares it. And and look at verse uh, number 54. And the day was the preparation and the Sabbath drew on. Of course, in Jewish teaching, you you couldn't bury a body on the Sabbath. Had to be done before that. And so uh, so the Sabbath, it was a preparation, meaning the day before. and And the Sabbath drew on. And the woman also, which came with him from Galilee, followed after and beheld the sepulcher and how his body was laid. And they returned and prepared spices and ointments and rested the Sabbath day according to the commandment. And so they will tell you, well, see, right there it is. Sabbath day, that's Saturday. Jesus had to die on Friday because it was just before the Sabbath. So what the Bible says, it was before the Sabbath. Look at chapter, uh, look at Mark chapter 15. And this is why they teach that. And if you don't know your Bible, you'll say, well, yeah, that's right. Amen? Look at uh, Mark chapter, you don't know when, when to say amen right now, do you? It's like, what point is he trying to make right there? Right? I'm just going to sit here and smile. <laughs> Mark 15, you'll have plenty of time to shout here in a minute, okay? Mark 15, look at verse number 42. Now when the even was come, because it was the preparation that is, the day before the Sabbath. They say, uh-huh, see, we told you. Uh, look at verse number uh, 43. Joseph of Arimathea, an honorable counselor, which also waited for the kingdom of God, came and went in boldly into Pilate and craved the body of Jesus. And so we see the same story told again here. So they're saying, okay, it's Sabbath. It's the day before the Sabbath. Sabbath is Saturday. It's got to be Friday. Well, the Bible does say it was the day before the Sabbath. That's absolutely true. Looks like we have a problem. But not if you go to your Old Testament and find out about the Sabbath. Let's go to the book of Leviticus. Way back there in the Old Testament. I worry about these people who don't, they don't ever read their Old Testament. Like, well, that's, that's past. We don't need that. Oh, yeah, you do. Jesus didn't come to destroy the law. He came to fulfill All the Old Testament does is show you who Jesus is and why you can trust Him. That's what it does. Uh, uh, Leviticus chapter 23. And if you mark your Bible, there'll be some verses you'll want to mark here. Now we've got to understand, there's two kinds of Sabbath. There's a weekly Sabbath. What is that? That is Saturday. Saturday. And then... We're going to read here in the book of Leviticus, chapter 23, beginning in verse number 23. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speaking to the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, in the first day of the month, ye shall have a Sabbath, a memorial, a blowing of trumpets, and holy convocation. And ye shall do no servile work therein, but ye shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. So here God is giving some of the yearly feasts. All right? And he says, on the seventh month, on the first day, you're going to have a Sabbath. Well, that falls on a different day of the week every year. It's just like Fourth of July. It's not always on the same day of the week. Right. Amen? I remember my brother asking one time, Doug, in Mexico, do they have Fourth of July? Yeah, they do. It comes right after the third. <laughs> Doesn't mean anything to them because they, they celebrate May the 5th, but... Some of you just went over your head. It's the same brother that I told him I had a job for him that's pulling out radiators out of air-cooled Volkswagens. But I gave you my phone number to call. Yeah, I would do that to my brother, and I did. 
So we got here a, a, a yearly Sabbath. It's a holiday, one of the, or excuse me, the holy days as they would say in the Old Testament. Seventh month, first day. That is the Feast of Trumpets. Go down to verse number 26. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Also on the tenth day of this seventh month, there shall be a day of atonement. And there shall be a holy convocation unto you. You shall afflict your souls and shall offer uh, an offering made by fire unto the Lord. You shall do no work in that same day, for it is the day of atonement to make atonement for you before the Lord your God. Now notice, it's still the seventh month. On the first day of the month, there's a Sabbath day. Now on the tenth day of that same month, there's another Sabbath. Cannot be the same day of the week. All right? So we're seeing these are dates, not day of the week. And it's just like any other Sabbath. You're not allowed to do any work on it. Um, look on, uh, let's see here. Jump down to uh, verse number uh, 32. We'll look at another one here. Uh, verse 31. You shall do no manner of work, and it shall be a statute forever throughout your generations and all your dwellings. It shall be unto you a Sabbath of rest. You shall afflict your, afflict your souls in the ninth day of the month at even. Notice this. From even unto even shall you celebrate your Sabbath. So here we have on the ninth day another Sabbath. But notice how that God is counting these days from even to even. All right, so it starts in the evening, goes all the way through the evening, then through the daytime, then it gets to where the next day starts at the next even. All right, that's how the Jews counted their day. So even to even, that's 24 hours. God's extremely clear about this. So when they had the yearly Sabbath, they were 24-hour periods of time that they were to serve the Lord. So here's the question. What Sabbath was it when Jesus was crucified? Was it a Saturday Sabbath, so it had to be crucified on Friday? Or was it a yearly Sabbath? That could have been any day of the week. Well, let's look at it. Go to, take your Bibles, go to the book of John, chapter number 19. I'm so glad our Bible gives us the answer. John, chapter number 19. I have so many tabs in here, I don't know which one to turn right now. I'm still confused. I know a chapter. <laughs> Brother Rich just looked at me like, you're confused, so am I. John chapter 19. Verse number 30, what a great verse. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. Hallelujah, aren't you glad he finished? Verse 31. The Jews therefore, because it was the preparation that the body should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath day. Now this would be a good place to mark in your Bible, for that Sabbath day was an high day. This isn't the weekly Sabbath. This is one of the yearly ones. Was an high day. Besought Pilate that, the le that their legs might be broken, that they might be taken away. And so we see that they come to now and, 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 and they want Jesus off the cross because a Sabbath day was coming. But we're not talking about a weekly Sabbath now. We're talking about a yearly Sabbath, a high day. So, well, which one? I'm glad you asked. Go to chapter 18. John chapter 18. And let's see, we'll start in verse. Let's see here. All right, verse number... Um, 26, we'll start there, 25. And Simon Peter stood and warmed himself and said, uh, therefore unto, unto him, uh, and they said, therefore unto him, art not thou one of his disciples? And he denied it and said, I am not. And of course, you know what, what event this is. This is when Jesus had told Peter, you're going to deny me three times. So it's the night of the, of the trial. One of the servants of the high priest being his kinsman, whose ear Peter cut off, said, did not I see thee in the garden with him? And he denied again, and immediately the cock crew. Then led they Jesus from Caiaphas to the hall of judgment, and it was early. And they themselves went not into the judgment, lest they should be defiled, but that they might eat the Passover. So he said, we're not going to go in there because we're, we're cleansing ourselves, getting ready for a Passover. All right, go to chapter 19 and verse number 14.
And it was the preparation of the, what does it say? Passover. Passover. And about the sixth hour, he said unto the Jews, Behold, your king. So it was the preparation. That's the day before. Right? So, so what, uh, when we look at this, when, when we look at what day, what Sabbath was it before Je- that right after Jesus was crucified? It was Passover. It was one of the yearly feasts. Uh, so that means it was on the 14th day. Right? Because God had outlined that. And so, now think about this. Jesus is crucified just before that. Because he had to be in the grave before Passover. All right? So, if Passover is on, on the day after, uh, that would mean Jesus was crucified on Wednesday. Passover is Thursday, the 14th day. Uh, but it gets better than that. Keep your place here. Go back to Leviticus chapter 23 again. I should have had to keep a marker there. I forgot we were going to go back to it. Leviticus 23. And verse number 5. These are the feasts of the Lord, even holy convocations, which shall, you shall proclaim in their seasons. In the 14th day of the first month at even is the Lord's Passover. All right, so we know Jesus was crucified just before Passover because he was in the grave before Passover started. Leviticus 23, 5. All right, look at verse 6. And on the 15th day of the same month is the feast of unleavened bread unto the Lord. Seven days shall you eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall have a holy convocation and you shall do no servile work therein. Now hang on. Jesus crucified on Wednesday. Thursday's Passover. That's a Sabbath day. That's the 14th day. Friday's the 15th. That is the Feast of Unleavened Bread, another, Paso- uh, another Sabbath day. Then Saturday is the weekly Sabbath. Not only was Jesus in the grave three full days and three full nights, He was in the grave three Sabbath days. Right. It gets better. Just hang on. Amen? Why three Sabbath days? Go back to the book of Colossians in your New Testament. Colossians chapter number Two. Colossians chapter number 2. And we'll begin in verse number 14. Man, these are great verses. I might kick my shoes off and have a spell here in a minute. Verse 14, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. Having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them, openly triumphing over them in it. Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of the new moon or of Sabbath day, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Why is it important that he was in the grave for three Sabbath days? Because he nailed all of that to the cross. He took all of those ordinances from Leviticus nailed it to the cross. Uh, I was speaking to somebody, I don't remember who was this week, talking about they knew somebody that's a practicing Jew. They're Orthodox. They do everything like the Old Testament Jews did. I said, oh, really? When was the last time they brought a lamb to church? <laughs> we don't have to worry about those anymore. Why? Because the lamb Amen. died, shed his blood. So when Jesus died on the cross and he was in the grave for those three days and three nights, he nailed all the ordinances to, Christ, uh, to, to, the, to the cross. He nailed all the food restrictions. Amen. Hallelujah for bacon. <laughs> Amen. I saw a sign in a restaurant not that long ago. It's the number one reason not to be a vegetarian. Bacon. <laughs> but all of those restrictions, you wonder why we don't follow those. Like if you're wearing a suit that's, that's wool, and you're wearing, uh, you know, and then you're wearing a cotton shirt. You just violated the Old Testament law. And I've got wool blend suits. Man, am I really messed up on that one? Amen. He, the, blo- the, the blotting out of the, the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. You know what the purpose of the law was? As Galatians tells us, it was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. It showed us how wicked we were. 
And Jesus took all of those things that were against us. You realize that was the evidence in the court case against us? That's how God proved we were sinners? That's how the Bible can tell us in, in, in John chapter 3 that we are condemned already because we have not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. He took all that and He nailed it to the cross. That's why we're no longer bound by the law. Because Jesus paid all of that. Verse 16, Let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of an holy day or of the new moon or of the Sabbath day. He's telling me, don't let somebody tell you you're not as good a Christian as they are because they, are, they are observe these holy days and you don't. Or they don't eat this and you do. He said, all that went out the window. Jesus nailed it to the cross. Amen? Which are the shadow of things that come with the bodies of Christ. Verse 17. So he nailed all of that to the cross. Now, why is that important? Because of what Jesus said. That as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so must the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. He had to go spend three days and three nights. Not parts of three days and three nights. God never takes shortcuts. And I've listened to guys, Brother Rich, I've listened to him to try to explain why that is three days and three nights from Friday night to Sunday morning. And you have to do some, you have to do as many mental gymnastics as a Democrat trying to explain a bill they're trying to put before you. And why it's good for you that they're going to take all your money and steal all of your rights. They just, they got all these excuses like, wait a minute, just back up. Have you listened to yourself? You know, the easy, you know, when you're reading the Bible, the first thing that you ought to do when you're trying to, to understand what the Bible says, take the clear meaning of the Scriptures. Can I tell you, a lot of stuff in your Bible is not a spiritual application. I mean, I've heard people talk about the height of the beast, you know, the, the image of the beast. And, you know, they got all these different things they teach on types. You know, the... the you know, the, 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 the size of the, uh, of the image of the beast in the, in the book of Revelation and, 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 and how many toes are on it and, and, and what the polish is on the toe. And, and they talk about stuff that God doesn't even talk about because it sounds good. You know, sometimes when God says, you know, something, He just means that. Um, and, and we add too many meanings. So if God says this means that, He will tell you that. If he doesn't tell you and you say that, that's just your opinion. That's not what God said. Jesus said three days and three nights. It does a couple things. Number one, if, if Jesus was in the grave three days and three nights like we've seen from the Scripture, we know it was just before Passover. We don't have to worry about it being Friday. We know he was in the grave for, for Passover. Well, we know he's there three days and three nights. Well, we know then the next day, had to be the next feast. It had to be the, uh, uh, mine just went like, Feast of Unleavened Bread on the 15th day of the month. So we know that. We know it had to be three days and three nights. Then we know it had to be Saturday because he didn't rise till Sunday. Right. Amen. Aren't you glad that the Bible just fits together like a glove? It proves the accuracy of the Word of God. Not only that, it proves the magnitude of God's grace. John th uh, Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We've all broken God's law. All those Old Testament sacrifices, all those Old Testament feasts, Passover, all of that in the Day of Atonement was to show we're wicked sinners and we cannot save ourselves. And that in Romans 5, 8, but God commendeth His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. One of the last things Jesus said on the cross was, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He was saying that not only to the Roman soldiers who nailed him to the cross, he was talking about the Jewish people who cried out, crucify him. Let his blood be upon us and upon our children. It was to prove the magnitude of his grace, but it also to prove the finality of the payment. Let's go back to the book of John, John chapter 19. Now we realize that he was, uh, you know, it's coming up on, on the, the, uh, the Passover. We know that that he had to be in the grave before that. But look at the, how, how wonderful our God is picking the date that his son would die on the cross. Look at verse number 28 of John 19. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. Why did Jesus say he was thirsty on the cross? Because he was fulfilling Old Testament scripture. 
Now there was set a vessel of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar and put it upon a hyssop and put it to his mouth. And when he had therefore received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed up his, about his head and gave up the ghost. And by the way, they didn't kill Jesus. He gave up the ghost. Right. He willingly did that. The Jew, now the Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation that the body should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath day, for it was, that Sabbath day was in high day, besought Pilate that their legs might be broken, that they might, not, that they might be taken away. They didn't want them up there. They didn't want to violate their law. They didn't want to, to mess with the Passover, not realizing the Passover was just paid. Amen. They were never going to have to do that one again. You see, when he died, if we were to go to Matthew's gospel, we'll not look at it tonight for a second time, but that's when the veil of the temple was rent from the top to the bottom. Yeah. Why? Because you didn't need one of those high priests anymore because the high priest just took care yeah. of business. Hallelujah for that. The finality payment, he said, it is finished. Go to the book of Hebrews, if you will. Hebrews uh, chapter number, uh, let's see, chapter 9, Hebrews 9. Verse 27, we know this one well. As it appoint, and as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. That's why you know you're not going to have a second chance. There's no purgatory. Nobody's going to pray you out. You die, then there's judgment. So Christ once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for Him He shall appear the second time without sin unto salvation. For the law, chapter 10, verse 1 having a shadow of good things to come, not the very image of the, uh, of the things, can, uh, can never with these, those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers therefore unto perfect. For then, would you not have, uh, for then would they not have ceased to be offered because that the worshipers once purged should have no more con con conscience of sins. But those sacrifices, but in those sacrifices there is remembrance again made of sins Every year. Now, now, verse 3 teaches us that those sacrifices, they were there just as a reminder. Anybody use reminders? I have them on my phone. They pop up. You know, they say different things. You know, I've got all kinds of stuff in my phone that just reminds up some just random facts that just pop up. Oh, yeah, that happened today. God said those Old Testament sacrifices, they weren't to take away your sin. Says verse 4, it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sin. God says it's not possible. No, they were just a reminder. Every year, God reminded them, you need a Savior. You need a Savior. Then Jesus came and said, I'm your Savior. And that's why you didn't have to offer those anymore. Amen? Uh, Wherefore, when He cometh into the world, He said, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. Jesus had to have a flesh and blood body. Why? So He could die. God's a spirit. He's not going to die. So you had to take the flesh of a man to die and could shed his blood in burnt offerings and sacrifice for sin. Thou hast had no pleasure. Then said I, lo, I am come. In the volume of the book it is written of me to do thy will, O God. So Jesus came, verse number 10, um, by the which we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Amen. Hallelujah. Um, Jesus paid the penalty. Uh, he, he took all of sin's payment, all of sin's debt that you and I and every human being that's ever owed, and he paid it in full. Uh, by the way, go back to the book of um, Ephesians. Now, remember, he was in the grave for how many days? Three days and how many nights? What kind of days were they? 24-hour days. What kind of special days were they? We just talked about it. They were Sabbath days. What could you not do on a Sabbath day? Go to Ephesians chapter 2. Brother Rich, I feel it coming on. Verse number 8. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Say it with me. Not of works, lest any man should both. On the Sabbath days, you and I are not, they were not, in the Old Testament, they were not supposed to work. So what did Jesus do for three Sabbath days, Brother Hunley? He was working. Think about that. For those three Sabbath days, He was taking care of all that stuff the Old Testament put on us because of our sin. He worked on those Sabbath days so we never have to for our salvation. 
He did it all. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad salvation just us receiving what He did? See, God's not afraid to work. He worked six days and He rested on the Sabbath. You know what He was doing, Brother Rich? He was showing us, I'm going to work on the Sabbath, but give me a while. Because He had a plan. Redemption's plan all happened on the Sabbath. That's when everything was paid. Now I realize He was crucified just for that, but He was in the grave those three days and three nights. That's what proves He is who He says He is. If He'd have never got up, He'd have been no different than Confucius or Muhammad. He'd been no different than anybody else who started a religion. He'd be no different than Jim Jones in Guyana when he drank his Kool-Aid. A leader of people or stirred a bunch of people up and then died. No, he died, but he got up three days later. Hallelujah. He paid sin's debt. And he stayed in the grave three days, three nights to prove that he had conquered all of the law. I'm going to to Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4. And then I'm going to need, after we read this verse, I'm going to need a couple guys to help me. Romans chapter 4, because we've got to crucify somebody. I'm kidding. I've got a handout for you. <laughs> Romans chapter 4 and verse number 5. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Aren't you glad you don't have to, nor can you work for your righteousness? I'm talking about for your soul, by being saved. No, he, he that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly. When Jesus paid all of that debt, was in the grave those three days and three nights, he proved that everything in the law had not been destroyed, but fulfilled. It had been accomplished. All the Old Testament pictures no longer mattered because you had the genuine. Amen? You had the real article. I mean, which would you rather have uh, in your presence? A picture of your wife or your wife? Hang the picture. Hey, Amen. You got that pun? You hang the picture? Some of you went right over your head. Man, you got to wake up before you come to church. Some of you are like, Pastor, that's enough. Get a couple of you guys. She... Pray for Brother Rich. He might not make it through the night. Brother Rich, Brother, uh, Brother Ron, come here if you would. Come on, guys. Make sure everybody gets one of these. I put together a little chart and just a few of the verses. Not a complete study. I am putting together a little booklet uh, that will have the whole study in it. But uh, in here I have traditions, explanation of parts of three days and three nights and how many hours it is. And then I have what Jesus said about how many days he had to be in the grave. And then the explanation of what those days are. Then there's a chart at the bottom that shows the day. On, uh, on Tuesday day, John and Peter uh, were sent to locate the place of the Last Supper. Tuesday evening, the Last Supper, praying in the garden, the betrayal, arrest, and the trials. That happened Tuesday night. Uh, Wednesday during the day, the trials end, the crucifixion, and the burial. Jesus dies at the ninth hour, that's 3 o'clock, was buried before 6 o'clock. Then it shows he's in the grave that Wednesday evening, which is the first part of that, that first day. He's in uh, during Thursday day, that would be the light part of the 24 hours of Passover, the high day Sabbath. Then the day two starts with Thursday, uh, Thursday evening, and then uh, that goes through midnight. Then the next day, uh, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So another high day Sabbath, that's day two. Then day three is the weekly Sabbath. That's Friday, starting at evening, all the way through uh, through the day Saturday. So sometime, that's the weekly Sabbath, sometime after 6 p.m. or sundown on Saturday night, and sunrise on what we would call Sunday morning, that's when Jesus got up. Amen? Does that make sense to you? Yes. Kind of breaks it down for you. And, uh, and Jesus uh, raised, he, he appears to Mary in the garden. You like to have been there. But she's, she thinks he's a gardener. What have you done with him? And she's crying and he says, Mary. And as soon as he said her name, she knew who that was. She'd heard that before. He called her by name. Oh, man. She came to worship. He said, touch me not. For I'm not yet ascended to my father. I believe that's when he took the blood. After three days and three nights. I believe that's when he took the blood 
in his resurrected body and walked into the holy place. And in Psalm 22, they said, who is the king of glory? They didn't know who he was because they hadn't seen the nail prints before. He brings the blood and puts it on the altar. And it's still there, by the way. Hallelujah. And then the women and the disciples come to the, the tomb during the day on Sunday. And that's when you know, Peter and John run to the tomb. They see the grave clothes, the napkin laying apart. And then Sunday evening, he appears to the disciples in the upper room, the first Sunday night church service in the New Testament age. Amen. There he is, after the resurrection. Uh, I think it will be a help to you. Uh, I am going to put together a little more detailed thing, but I want to put that in your hands. So why are you teaching it now? Because we've got Easter coming up. You have a lot of people talking to you about Good Friday. You having a Good Friday service? Nope. We're not. I'm not mad at people to do. They've just not been taught. Amen? Pardon me? We're having a Wednesday service. That's exactly right. Amen. Hallelujah. And it was a good Wednesday. Amen? Why? Because sin's debt had been paid. Hallelujah. When did he die? He died, he died on Wednesday. And uh, he was in the grave before sundown. Amen? And come Sunday morning, when sun came up, sun had already gotten up. Hallelujah. Amen? Just wanted to give that to you. I, it just it amazes me how many books I read. I'm talking of independent Baptist preachers who talk about a Good Friday service and Friday crucifixion. Doesn't match up with your Bible, but this one does. And, uh, and man, it's more than just three days. It's three Sabbath days. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad you have a Savior that took care of everything? What a wonderful Savior. Like somebody ought to sing, oh, what a Savior. Uh, as we do have a marvelous Savior. Let's pray, Father, thank you for our Savior. Thank you that we can trust your book. We can trust him when he said, as Jonah was in the whale three days and three nights, the Son of Man will be in the heart of the earth three days and three nights. And he was. I pray you'd help us to understand that when he did that, he paid all of sin's debt. Everything that was against us was completely paid and the record now is clear when we come and trust Him as our Savior. Help us this week to be diligent to tell somebody else about Him. Pray you'd help us to have the boldness to just go ahead and speak about Him clearly and may others get to know our Savior because of our bold witness for Him. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, let's go ahead and take our prayer sheets out. We're going to go ahead and shift into that very quickly. And if you, um, I will be getting together a book for you fairly soon. That'll have before Easter. I'll have it for you with all of the all of the references and probably a few more. For a second time, we we didn't cover all that we could. Let's go ahead and get our. Um, let's see, we'll do our prayer letters at this point. I think. Go ahead and pull that out. Somewhere I have a schedule of service, but I don't know what I do with it. Who knows? All right. Let's look at the, um, we'll start with uh, Brother Poole, Walter Poole, our missionaries to uh, Cambodia. And we'll go ahead and switch to the pulpit mic now. It's got some pictures on there that you'll see. And then, and uh, so I wanted to make sure that you had those because he refers to those pictures. And uh, he thanks us for the support and for us praying for them. And, and uh, he, he says, your investment has enabled us to preach the gospel in Cambodia as your representatives. And uh, then he gives us some specific things. In 2016, over 250 people uh, heard either a portion or a full gospel explan explanation. Uh, that means by, in their ministry, in almost every case, this explanation was on a one-to-one -one basis. So almost you know, 250 times they were able to present the gospel. That's awesome. Amen. Others heard the gospel in a group setting such as church, but were not included in the count of 250. All were challenged in some way to consider Jesus as their personal Savior. Praise the Lord that 28 of these did pray for salvation. Hallelujah. Amen. Um, and we, are, we are especially happy about, in particular, five children who prayed with us. Uh, because they're regular Sunday school students, there's much hope that they will continue on to spiritual maturity. And then he gives a couple stories behind the numbers. Uh, Porty. Uh, a small girl in the, in the picture, and uh, they met her at the, where they used to hold church, their old location, and uh, they were there for about five years, and um, 
She attended children's services until they moved to another street. Uh, listen to her simple faith. Um, her parents are not believers. And one neighbor, one little neighbor playmate told her, Jesus is not good, trying to get her to stop going to church. But before he said, confidently said, Jesus is good. He went about doing good things to people. That's exactly what Acts says. He went about doing good. One time she begged uh, my wife to come and visit her more. And my wife replied saying, whenever you want me to come visit, just ask Jesus to tell me to come. The other day, my wife did indeed go to visit her. And Pori said she had just prayed previously for my wife to come. Another time, Pori told us that she had, been, uh, she had seen or felt like there were some ghosts coming to bother her. But she prayed to Jesus and they went away. She's only five or six. But her faith is simple and real. How's your faith? Isn't that an amazing paragraph right there? Please pray that her father will let her come to our new location and that she would, uh, she would keep that beautiful faith. Then uh, uh, father, picture of, of, of uh, Brother Poole, and a man standing, uh, or I'm sorry, sitting on the floor shows a, a father of some children we know well. Um, he doesn't live with the children anymore, only visits occasionally. So you never met him. Um, said, so you'll see a picture book on the floor, and you look at that uh, middle picture. You see him there, and uh, on it is he has the, uh, uh, the two roads, one to heaven and one to hell. He currently lives in a remote location with no, no church, and for that reason, he assumed he could not get saved. I explained that Jesus was everywhere. And he could get saved that very day. He did pray with me, and then later left for his village. And uh, just isn't amazing how God arranged that meeting so the guy could get saved. And then he shows his typical soul winning, uh, what they do that uh, he's just showing the flyer from their church uh, in the third picture there. And he go to the people in the streets, inside alleys and courtyards. They knock on doors and speak with children. And um, they usually just spend a little time getting to know them, satisfying the curiosity. And uh, then they, they turn the conversation towards spiritual things and have the opportunity to share the word of God. And, uh, and so this man responded um, when he heard the name of Jesus, that uh, he, had, he had heard of Jesus and had read some of the things or talked to some people who did not have an understanding. You know, we take that for granted in America. We've all heard of Jesus, you know, and uh, he had no biblical understanding. But um, um, he says he agreed that Jesus' religion was good and, and taught people a good way, but he did not feel any urgency to commit his life to the Savior. And he said, I will think about it. And uh, so he asked that we pray that this man would get saved. Uh, and then he lists here um, specific things to pray for, uh, workers to join us, whether they be nationals or fellow missionaries, purchase of land and a building uh, they're currently looking, additional preaching service in English for foreigners or Cambodians who speak English, and the health of our family and the development of their children. So again, he thanks us for our, our uh, prayer and support of them. Good letter there. And then um, this letter is from uh, Dr. John Green with uh, um, the... Parker Memorial Baptist Church printing ministries are kind of renaming things a little bit just to be clear who they're talking about. And of course, that includes Bearing Precious Seed Scripture Printing, the Calvary Publishing that they do for, um, for churches. The Bearing Precious Seed prints the tracts and Bibles to send to the missionaries. Calvary Publishing is when they print tracts and things for local churches. And then local church Bible publishers, we have some of their, their Bibles that they offer in English here. Uh, and he talks about it was a year of transition. He talked about that for us when he was here with our missions conference, how that uh, Brother John took over as the, uh, the new leader uh, of, the, of the ministry as far as the director. And, uh, <clears throat> and so they've been updating uh, the accountability system of their, their, their church for all of the gifts that are, that are given to that ministry. Um, and that's now all being completed. He says there in the uh, third paragraph there, the Lord provided over one million scriptures to be printed and are being made to, uh, uh, available to missionaries all over the world. Think about that. In the last year, a million scriptures. And we take that for granted because we can go buy a Bible, but missionaries can't get Bibles, and they're producing them. So praise the Lord for that. And uh, hundreds of thousands of gospel portions were distributed to faithful workers, missionaries, and churches along the border of Mexico. A brother who works with our uh, with our military as an outreach uh, was provided with about 10,000 pocket-sized John and Romans to give uh, hope and help to our soldiers. And uh, he talks about the bilingual uh, in Spanish-English John and Romans that they printed. And, um, and so there's a lot of things going on there. They are asking for some help with what they call seed line churches, that they'll receive those scriptures, assemble them together, staple them, and send them back. And uh, I'm talking to him about getting us set up to do that. 
where uh, maybe a couple times a month we'll meet here at the church and assemble some scriptures together. Amen? And we're working on that. We've got some things to tell you about once we get it, uh, all the details worked out, but we want to help with that and uh, get our hands on some of that. Amen? Be a part of that. And uh, some of you are not able to walk door to door, but you can help assemble scriptures, staple them together. Amen. So we're gonna get we're gonna be a part of that this year. We're working on that, and uh, and then um, he told us a little bit about this. I've gotten a couple updates. Uh, they were recently contacted about a large uh, printing press, a big uh, web press. As you know, they had been farming out all of their printing of the of the big Bibles and stuff to somebody else. Well, they've they've um, uh, purchased the press for ten thousand dollars. It's going to cost one hundred and fifteen thousand to move it and reassemble it. That's where the money is, because this thing is massive. Um, it wouldn't fit in this building. The ceiling's not high enough, and it's, it's um, 60 feet long, I think he said it was, maybe 70. He told me, I don't remember now, but um, they're going to have to build a building uh, to do that on their property. They've already got the place laid out where they're going to do that. So please be praying for that, as that's their, their goal, as they're raising, their, they're moving the press to have it stored until they can get the building ready to put that up. Um, but it's going to really enhance what they're able to do and the number of scriptures they're able to print. So please be praying for that. And so it's a good letter of, uh, of update for there. So please be praying for that. Go get your prayer sheets out. Give you a couple of other updates. Then Brother Allen's going to come and, and uh, go through some prayer requests. Um, continue to pray for... Um, my mind just went totally blank. Um, don't you hate it when that happens to you? Um, pray for Luann Markovich. We've got her, her prayer request here. Um, her daughter, Sarah, and the baby. The baby is due after April 22nd, but has um, other ideas. Pray for a healthy mother and baby. So be praying for that. And uh, that's why you can't predict when they're going to come. They come on their birthday. So, <laughs> do you like that? And... Uh, be praying um, then for, uh, let's see, we've got a couple folks here that are out sick tonight. Brother Layton is sick tonight, and uh, they keep passing that cold around. Any update on him other than he's just got that, okay? Uh, pray for Aiden. Uh, little Aiden has strep throat again. They sent him home from school today. Uh, not feeling well, and so that, and be praying for Eleanor. She had her surgery yesterday. It went well. Uh, where they replaced the stuff in her knee. They had her up walking today and uh, said she's a lot of pain, but she's progressing and, and sounds good, doing well. So be praying for her. And then I'll give you two more, and then Brother Allen will come and go over a few of these others. Um, be praying for my dad. Um, Saturday will be the one-year anniversary of mom going to heaven. And dad's really thinking about that. And uh, it just got real vivid in his mind because, remember Sunday I talked about one of the deacons of my home church, Don Williams, and all his boys that are pastors and grandsons. Well, Don Williams passed away yesterday. And uh, his viewing is Friday night and the funeral Saturday. And uh, so I'm going to be down with Dad on Friday. I'm going to be taking him to the viewing. I don't know that Dad will go to the funeral. I don't know that he can handle that. Maybe praying for Dad. He's known Brother Williams for over half a century. Uh, Brother Williams a wonderful, wonderful man. And uh, so be praying for the family of the Williams. Be praying for Dad. Then pray for my sister Charlotte. Uh, just a dear, dear friend of hers. Somebody she's known about 40 years. Um, good, good friend. Um, passed away with cancer uh, yesterday. His viewing is on Friday, and his funeral is on Saturday. And um, you know, this is somebody very special to my sister. So if you'd pray uh, for the Keith Beck family, if you would. And uh, he loved the Lord, and uh, just was a, uh, he was a school teacher for many, or for many years, and a uh, good man. Just be praying for the family. All right, Brother Allen, you go ahead and come, and uh, take any other requests. I know I'm missing one, but maybe I'll think of it. And uh, take those and then pray for us. All right, any other prayer requests tonight? Any prayer requests? Yes.
All right, so Carol Kepke, um, as a lot of you know her, um, she passed away. Uh, if you want information about the funeral, you can see Miss Wilkerson afterward, afterwards. I know she gave it, but <laughs> uh, you can see her afterwards for information on that. But pray for the family, um, for Carol Kempke's family. Anybody else? Yes. <laughs> it's only been five years. Oh, it's been around for five years, though. Yeah, almost six. All right, so that was for Sarah, for her pain and swelling in her ankle to go away after this most recent surgery. Anybody else? Any other prayer requests? Pray yes, Pam. Yes, Pam. So we'll pray for Pam. Uh, she has a pain in her neck. Um, she wants that to go away. Any other prayer request? Yes, Jean. Pray for Sherry as she fell yesterday. She's sore. She doing good though, better Dave? She'll be all right. Okay. We'll pray for her. Any other prayer requests? All right. Let's go ahead and pray. Dear Lord, thank you for this day I've given to us. Thank you for the time that we have together uh, to be able to come and uh, worship you and to learn about you. Lord, thank you for being so specific and detailed in, um, in your word and giving us everything that we need to know um, about you uh, so we can learn and understand more about you and just how and when you died, Lord. And um, That wasn't on Friday, but it was indeed on Wednesday and that you did ro um, rise again. Lord, we do come before with many requests. Uh, we do think of our missionaries as the, they're out serving in different fields. Um, just be with them uh, and give them the um, protection that they need. Uh, give them the comfort that they need as they're away from families and they've been away uh, probably for many years. Um, but just give them the comfort they need. Give them that protection. Uh, we do think of Brother Poole, Lord, as uh, he has asked for many requests. We do think of uh, that little girl named uh, Puri. As uh, the church is now a little bit further away and uh, dad's not letting her go, just help her to help the father to let her uh, come to church again. And thank you for her faith and just how that is uh, a tremendous testimony, Lord, for, for her and for you. Just uh, how simple a faith can be in, in one's life. And uh, just be with her and be with the other ones that uh, have been reached by the pool's ministry. Um, especially the ones in this letter. Uh, we think of the, the father of some children that uh, come to his church and how he um, got saved, Lord, and just uh, be with him as he's now going back to his village. And just, Lord, we know that wasn't just an accident. That was a meeting planned by you. And uh, just be with all the different times that they go out soul winning. And we do think of the uh, Parker Memorial Baptist Church Printing Ministries, Lord, as they're looking at getting this new printing press and getting that all set up. Just be with them, help them be able to get the funds for that, to be able to um, get that transporter from one location to their location, and then uh, to get the building up quickly and get it all set in place so they could continue on doing your work. We do come before you with some other requests. We think of those that have had surgery uh, recently, Lord, as they've, they're healing. Uh, give them um, 
uh, quick recovery uh, so that way they can get rid of the pain or swelling or whatever the case might be. Just be with them and uh, as they do now go through this uh, time, be with them also as they might have to go through some physical therapy. And just uh, be with the doctors and giving them wisdom on that. What do you think of Pam Lord? Is uh, She has um, pain in her neck from a previous injury. Just uh, heal her body and help that pain to go away. Um, what do you think of uh, Carol's family, Lord, as um, she passed away? And just uh, be with those that have known her. And just uh, be with the funeral and just be with everything that goes on there. Just give the family comfort during this time of mourning. Also, uh, be with uh, Grandpa, Lord, as he's um, coming up on the one-year anniversary of going home with uh, Grandma, Lord, and just uh, be with her or be with him as uh, he's thinking on those things, especially with the passing away of a, a dear friend. Um, it's, it's a difficult time, Lord, and also be with Aunt Charlotte. as uh, She also lost a good friend, and just be with everything that goes on there. And just, uh, Lord, continue being with uh, us as a church. Help us as we do want to continue moving forward for you. Uh, we also think of Lou Ann, Lord. Um, our daughter Sarah, Lord, is uh, her baby is due in, on April 22nd, uh, but is uh, having uh, some different ideas about that. And just be with the, the delivery. Just help it to be a good one, Lord, and help it, the baby to be healthy. Help the mommy to be healthy as well. We just want to thank you for everything that you have done. In Jesus' name, amen. Expecting Cindy in a minute. But Brother Rich, why don't you go ahead and go. There you are. I didn't see you come in. Good. Uh, last night was an exceptional night at the uh, Salvation Army uh, where we go down and, and, and are able to minister to people there uh, as part of our RU ministry. And so, Cindy, come on up, and we wanted to have you give a testimony. Then, Brother Rich, I'll have you give a, a brief testimony at the end and then pray for us. We won't be dismissed. So just bear with us a few minutes. You want to hear this. This is the ministry you're praying for. At least I hope you're praying. Cindy. Um, we had a record high of. You're fine. Is it okay? Okay. Um, we had an almost record high attendance last night with 13 people, so it was good. Um, our record is 14, but it was it was pretty close. Lots of ladies, so girls. We I think we had more girls than boys that time, um, which is nice. We we've, we kind of struggled to get the ladies to come, but one thing I was thinking about just the last couple of days, and um, Ron and I were talking about this, that we it's a ministry which is three of us that go, but everybody in this church contributes to it in so many ways, and. And one way I was thinking about was, you know, with the ministry that we've had with the ladies taking the gifts to them and things like that. And last Mother's Day, we had, we had collected the gifts that the ladies had given, Bath and Body Works stuff and all that stuff. And we had 20, 20 gift bags that we gave to the ladies. And um, I have a little picture, actually, of Haley and Abby helped me pack those up. So we got Haley and Abby that helped. We have all the ladies who contributed the gifts that helped. We took those in. We gave them to the ladies over there. We got rid of all 20 bags. There are more ladies than I even knew. When I was in the lobby, in the lobby area, I would give it to one lady. That lady would say, just a minute, I'll be back. And she'd go grab her roommate, and they'd come down out of the hallway. And we had two ladies I know come to the meeting the next week because of that. And that just really reminded me that, that we, can, we can work together as a church to be able to reach out to these people. And, you know, the, there are hurting people everywhere. It's not just a place like that. But a place like, like that, I think people are more willing to admit it, you know, that they're struggling with things because they, they know, you know, that you're there to help them. And the, the best way I know to help hurting people is obviously introduce them to Jesus, which is what we do. But to do that, you have to let them know that you care and that you're their friend. And by, by just being there as their friend, by listening to them, by giving them the gifts, it's been a, you guys have all been a good help, you know, for us to be able to do that. So we had one lady there last night, just to give an example, she has 13 children. Four of them have died. She was with one of them when he died. I don't know why. She didn't say. But, you know, just think about a lady like that with Mother's Day coming up. You know, if anyone's lost a child, you would kind of understand how difficult of a time that would be. And just to have somebody come and, and spend the time with you and listen to you and, and give you a little gift and say, we're thinking of you on Mother's Day, that kind of stuff just makes a big difference. So, so thank you all for your support, and keep it up. Amen. One thing that amazes me about the Salvation Army is, is how things have evolved. You know, um, we do things a little differently than we did early on, and yet the people are so receptive, you know. I mean, one thing that we've done consistently is we've just keep loving on these people. And right now, there's, it seems like there's so many people that are hurting, but they're reaching out. And I think God's just drawing those people to us for some reason. And, and I think it's just God. It's all you can explain. Because I don't feel like we're doing things totally differently. But, you know, they're, they're just coming, and they're just reaching out. And, of course, when they come, we're going to give them the gospel. You know, it's just amazing. And a lot of times people have some knowledge about God, but they've never been taught properly. And a lot of times people are even saved, but they don't understand a lot of things. 
you know, I went through the plan of salvation several times last night, and, and I just tried to encourage the people. And, and I said, you know, if you're here tonight, I said with our heads bowed and eyes closed, if you're here tonight and you've never, you're not 100% sure you're on your way to heaven, you could pray a prayer. And if you mean it with your heart, and I had, I had given that plan of salvation and talked about those things just before that for probably about 40 minutes. And uh, honestly, there, there had to be four or five people that were praying the sinner's prayer. It seemed like the whole room was praying, didn't it, Cindy? It was just loud. But here's the thing. I don't know who got saved, who didn't get saved, but I do know there was a couple people that were making some serious statements after that. This one lady, and that was the lady you was talking about, they had the 13 children. She goes, I feel so much better now, you know. Well, sometimes you do feel better when you do pray and get saved, you know. Here's the thing. We're going to keep working with them. Be praying for those people, please. They're supposed to be, many of them are supposed to be coming to church on Sunday. And we're trying to get them here. And I'll be back there Saturday seeking those people and looking to get them and get some commitments from them people to be here. And we'll get that van running and have it out there. And we let them know that we're going. And then I'm going to be there Friday also, be praying for Friday because we're trying to draw some people to RU. And we've already got some people, oh, and we're going to be there. Here's the thing. The devil doesn't like it. And we've got to pray. If we're going to get them, it, we've, we've got to, the Lord has to, has to help us. And we've got to, they, they deserve our prayers. And that's what we're supposed to do is pray for them. So I appreciate your prayers, and uh, but just pray for that, would you? Thank you. All right, Pastor wants me to pray. Dear God, we do thank you, Father, for meeting with us tonight. Father, we just thank you for the clear teaching, Father, tonight. We thank you, Father. Help us to be able to convey that in a nice way, Father, to others as we talk with them. Help us to be able to open the Bible and show some of the verses that Pastor did tonight so that we can help people get the understanding that the Bible is the, is the clear understanding and help people to come to that serious truth. Lord, we have so much to pray for. We do pray for Salvation Army, Father, the many people that we minister to. I pray you'll draw them to yourself, Father. I pray that they'll come to church Sunday. Lord, I pray that you'll just use us to do a work for you, Father. In this day and age where there's so many people hurting, help us, Father, to have clear eyesight that we can reach out to others and draw them, uh, give them the truth so that they can come to you, Father. Lord, we just thank you for tonight, for church. Thank you for all that you do in our lives. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Just uh, quickly, we're dismissed, but just um, if you're talking to somebody this week and they've always been taught Good Friday, don't argue with them. It's not time to beat them up. Just when God opens an opportunity, when they're ready to listen, yeah. But if you talk to them about the fact Jesus did raise from the dead, but want you to understand, because it is an important doctrine, but you don't beat them about the head about that, you know? Uh, just like you don't get in somebody's face over, well, the King James Bible is the inspired word of God. Well, it is. It's the preserved word of God. Every word's true. But get him to Jesus first. Then we'll teach him the other stuff. Amen? So just uh, be careful about that. Um, sometimes I think we can get aggressive in things that they're important doctrines, but the most important thing is know there is a Savior. Get them to know him. Then you can teach them all things what's I've commanded you afterwards. So be careful of that. Let's get the gospel out. Amen? God bless you. Dismissed. Thanks for the extra time you gave us tonight. What a good testimony. That's worth listening to. Amen? Praise the Lord. You're dismissed. Um, let's put him in the bookstore. Okay. Yeah, we'll put him in the bookstore. Okay. That works for me.